Hi PGCon, this is Thomas Munro. Thanks for tuning into my talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about a couple of projects of mine to reduce IO stalls and memory stalls um, in a couple of areas that I've been hacking on recently. So this is a hacking track talk describing work in progress. The title of the talk is borrowed from performance guru Martin Thompson, who popularized mechanical sympathy as a term to describe programming, a style of programming that's very conscious of the hardware. And um, so I'm applying that type of thinking to our favorite blue elephant. A bit about myself, I am a Postgres developer and um, committer. I've been, um, I recently joined the Postgres team at Microsoft. Uh, before that, I worked for um, full time on Postgres for about five years at Enterprise DB. And I've used Postgres as an application developer since, I hate to say it, but release 7.4. First, I'm going to talk about an IO project uh, and some context around that. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about a memory project and some context around that and some areas for other exploration. I'm going to break predictions about future disk access into three different categories. The first is not data dependent. It's just a bet that you're going to access the same data repeatedly. If you've accessed it recently and or frequently, you're probably going to want it again soon. And that's why we have, that's why we have caches. The second category is um, heuristics about sequential access. If you seem to be accessing blocks sequentially, you're probably going to keep doing that for a little while longer. And that prediction is also not um, data dependent. So it can be done by lower levels of, uh, of a storage stack. And those kind of predictions enable us to make much larger read sizes, which can get all kinds of efficiencies from lower levels. And the third category is data dependent complex access patterns that require specialized logic that understands what's going on in the data. For example, if you're following, if you're doing a B-tree scan, in order to know which pages you might want next, you're going to have to look at the data and understand what it means. So that can't be done by lower level parts of the system automatically. At the moment, we rely on the operating system to detect sequential scans, and we um, hope that it will do something efficient with that. Um, and that mostly works pretty well, although there are plenty of cases where it doesn't, and I'll mention those in a minute. Um, then we do some explicit hinting of random access for bitmap heap scans, where we know in advance that we're going to be accessing um, some non-sequential blocks, um, and we can tell the kernel about that. And there's a similar case inside some vacuum cleanup code. So that's pretty limited. And the way it works is by calling prefetch buffer. Prefetch buffer is a, is a um, function in Postgres that checks if the buffer is already in the buffer pool. And if it, if it isn't, it issues a hint to the operating system, which I'll talk about in a moment. There's also some hinting about write back, which I won't be going into in this talk that involves the sync file range system call. So what does prefetch buffer actually do? Well, at the moment it uses, it checks whether the buffer is already in Postgres's uh, shared buffers. And if it is, then it doesn't have to do anything at all. If it isn't, then it tells the kernel that we're going to be reading it soon. And it does that using the POSIX F advise will need hint. That's a hint to the kernel that we'll soon be doing a P read. And if it could please start organizing to get that data into, into its own you know, kernel buffers, that would be great. And then hopefully, um, if we do that, you know, if the stars are aligned correctly, then when we eventually call P read, it doesn't need to sleep. It just returns instantly copying the, you know, copies the data out to, to user space and, that, and that's all it has to do. Now, as far as I know, that only actually works on Linux and NetBSD today. I looked at a whole bunch of different operating systems and I couldn't find any others where it, where it worked. Um, even on those systems, it doesn't yet work on ZFS, which is a, an important file system that I really like. Um, I'm personally interested in trying to get that fixed, um, but I make no promises about uh, how and when that might happen. Um, so a bunch of work is being done 
uh, by um, Andres Freund, I'm hoping to help him with that, and I'm sure others are as well, um, on introducing real asynchronous I.O. to Postgres. And for more on that, you could go to, uh, or rather tune in to Andres Freund's talk um, at um, PGCon 2020. So um, even if we switch to a real asynchronous I.O. in Postgres in the future, um, that doesn't really change the things that I'm talking about in this talk, which is when should we begin prefetching buffers, uh, which is kind of an orthogonal question, um, orthogonal to how we actually do that. So um, there's a whole bunch of other opportunities we could take to um, predict I.O. Uh, and prefetch stuff. Um, we could do a better job with sequential scans. Uh, there's a bunch of opportunities to prefetch index pages and um, nested loop joins. This is much more ambitious. Um, you could do some kind of prefetching and, and, and block nest loop join um, optimizations considering several keys at once. Um, and finally, while replaying the wall in, in crash recovery or on a replica server, you pretty much know what blocks you're going to be accessing. And that's the, um, that's the topic I'm going to dig into next. If you were at PGCon 2018, then this might all sound very familiar to you because Sean Chittenden presented the PG Prefolder project then. And it's something that Joyent used to fix their problem with replication latency. If I remember correctly, they were using uh, large RAID systems with many spindles. So they had a certain amount of concurrency, IO concurrency available. And you know, until they started doing this prefaulting, they weren't able to take advantage of that. The approach that I'm proposing um, doesn't have a separate process. It runs inside Postgres and it runs in fact as part of the main replication loop because uh, it turned out there were a whole bunch of really tricky problems to do with staying in sync that um, that's solved. And I also think that it um, provides a more natural pathway towards proper asynchronous IO in the future. So let's take a look at the contents of the wall. I'm going to run an insert statement to insert two rows into a table T. The table happens to have an index on it. Um, and you can see that that simple statement generated five wall records. And you can see that with PG wall dump. It produces much more output than this, but I've just taken the interesting bits. And the only thing we really want from this is the block, physical block references. Everything else in the wall, with some very minor exceptions, is not really relevant to, for prefetching purposes. Here is a simple depiction of the recovery process running. It processes the wall record by record, and it's full of those instructions that say, hey, I need um, I, I need to insert a, a tuple into the heap. Um, I need this page, please. And, and the recovery process is going to go and See if it can find it in the in the Postgres buffer pool. If it can't find it there, it'll it'll have to read it in, and it'll go to the operating system and say pread, and that's going to potentially involve a stall. We have to wait for the storage system to come back with that data and give it to us. That's time when the recovery process is not even running. It's not on. It's not on CPU. It's just you know sleeping, waiting for an I/O completion event to wake our process back up and um, for our synchronous system call to return. So it's a terrible waste of time. It's bad because the wall might have been generated by a primary server that was running many backends. And although each of those backends, perhaps there were 50 backend processes and they were all suffering from IO stalls from time to time, but those IO stalls were overlapping and they wrote the, um, you know, they wrote a bunch of records into the wall that recovery is now having to play back sequentially. And so it'll take all of those overlapping stalls and turn them into non-overlapping stalls. So they get added together and you get replication lag. So our goal here is to try and get back the overlapping stalls so that um, you can hopefully run at the same speed as the um, primary server ran or faster. The idea with recovery prefetching is to have a second read head that runs 
slightly further ahead of recovery in the wall. And it simply looks at all the records coming down the pipe, checks what blocks they reference, checks if they're already in the buffer pool, and if they're not, begins. it asks the operating system to begin reading that block in um, so that hopefully by the time recovery uh, gets around to needing the block, it's already there and it never has to sleep. That's the goal. Um, now, um, it assumes that the storage system can execute more than one uh, read at the same time. And you have to tell it with a, with a setting how many parallel um, reads it should initiate. And since for now we don't have any completion event delivery to Postgres, we assume that the, the asynchronous read operation is completed when we've replay when we finally replay the log record that caused the the read to be initiated so that's a conservative model of how many ios are currently in flight as a result of this scheme so how does it look to use well there's um, a pair of controls maintenance io concurrency and max recovery prefetch distance Maintenance I.O. concurrency is a general um, gook that exists already that is used to control uh, prefetching for any kind of maintenance tasks. So I'm categorizing wall prefetching or recovery prefetching as a kind of maintenance task. And max recovery prefetch distance is the main on off switch for this feature. And the patch as I've been posting it on the hackers list, it defaults to having it on. Um, you can set it to, I set it to 256, 256 kilobytes, pretty arbitrarily, minus one turns it off. Um, and there's a view, PG stat prefetch recovery, and that shows you some some counters. And you can see how many pages have been prefetched already, um, how many have been skipped for various different reasons. Um, so the most interesting one is probably skip hit. It tells you um, that how many pages it found were already in the, in, in the buffer pool, and so there was no reason to do any prefetching. Uh, but there's some other reasons that are a bit more technical, and I'm not going to uh, go into in the, this talk. Um, and another interesting number is the queue depth that tells you in, at this very moment how many um, prefetches are in flight. Um, there's also some averages for those, and you can reset this using the standard PG. Uh, what is it? PG um, stat reset shared. If you want to clear all these counters. Here's an example that shows unpatched Postgres first, um, using IO stat to measure the IO generated by a PG bench with 16 connections, the 16 threads. Um, so you can see that the primary server is, do, is generating 3,466 reads per second, and it has a queue depth somewhere around 16, or it kind of fluctuates, but something like that. So it's sort of reflecting the number of clients and you know they're they're all stalling um, quite often as they fetch pages from, from from disk, and so that's generating the worst case scenario for unpatched Postgres and the best case scenario for for, for my experimental patch. Um, so you can see that the replica is only able is only generating 250 reads per second, and its queue queue size floats around one, and it's just not able not able to keep up, and that's pretty much reflecting the number of um, concurrent IOs, right? One versus 16. And um, when we used the the patch, and I should add that this experiment was done with full page writes off, which gives you the absolute best case scenario. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so using the default maintenance IO concurrency with the patch, you, which is 10, um, so the replica running with 10, it's now able to generate 1,143 reads per second. Now we know that's not quite enough because we need to, should be somewhere around three, somewhere over 3,000 to be able to keep, keep up with the primary server. And we can see that the, the queue depth is now hovering around seven. And if we crank it up, um, which is, you know, we were targeting 10, but for various reasons, um, there were really only seven at a time because of slightly different accounting because of, well, because um, we don't, count things that were already in the kernel's cache, uh, you know, th those 
we consider those to be still a prefetch, even though um, nothing was done, no IO was hit, hit the storage layer. There's that, and then there's the fact that we count the end of the um, the end of the prefetch activity very conservatively when you finally p read the page, whereas it actually finished before that. So for various reasons, the q depth seen in IO stats going to be lower. Um, so if I crank it right up to, here I went right up to 50, and finally that was able to um, generate more um, concurrent I.O. than the primary is generating with 16, 16 sessions. And that finally gets me to a situation where um, it's able to keep up and in fact go faster than, go faster and therefore catch up. And so that's a, that, that solves the problem. So that sounds uh, pretty good, but it isn't always as good as that. Um, that. That was pretty much the best case scenario. Um, it works best with full page writes off because full page writes avoid the need for reads. Mostly you hear people complaining about um, the bad things about full page writes, which are that they generate a ton of extra wall on the primary server, but they do have upsides as well. Um, and one of them is that they avoid um, IO stalls on the on replicas because they don't require you to to read anything if you're completely overwriting a page there's no need to read um, it still works pretty well even with full page writes on if there are infrequent checkpoints and certain access patterns so that um, pages get um, modified modified you know many times between um, between checkpoints and um, you know the working set is much larger than memory it also works well for systems that have a storage page size larger than Postgres's 8K pages. For example, I know from Joint's talk that they were using large ZFS records, ZFS, uh, however you want to say it, um, which I think is, I think they used 16 kilobyte pages. I can't remember, but that means that even when there's a full page write, eventually that page gets written back and then the operating system has to do a read before write to, to you know, to actually do that. So prefetching would be good. Um, although, as I mentioned, this particular prefetching technique won't work with ZFS um, yet. Um, it would also be useful useful with full page rights on if we were to adopt an idea that uh, um, appeared on the mailing list recently. Uh, somebody asked why we, why we don't, you know, the whole full page rights thing is about not trusting pages that, um, um, you know, might be torn because of a because of power loss. Um, but if you've got checks, if you've got checksums on on, and you read a page, you ought to be able to say, well, if the checksum passes, then this must be a non-torn page. So you could actually read pages even if you have a full page write, uh, full page image in the wall, and then <clears throat> you know, and then then you might be able to skip a whole lot of work if you read it and find that the LSN is too high. Um, so that's something we're not taking advantage of. We're, we're finish up replaying a lot more than we have to um, because of full page rights. If we were to take up that idea, then this concept of prefetching would become more valuable with full page rights on. If you follow, it's a bit confusing. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so Another problem, just just a small implementation problem, really, that just requires more work, is that currently there's a separate xlog reader um, to decode the wall for prefetching purposes. So that's something that would need to be improved. Um, that's about all I have to say about that project. Um, yeah, it's actively pro being proposed for Postgres 14, and there's a commit first entry and a thread and everything. Um, yeah, have a look. So now I'm going to change gears a bit and talk about memory. While I was working on parallel hash joins for Postgres, I read a whole bunch of different papers about different aspects of that problem. And this one um, caught my eye. It, it, it talks about how um, hash joins suffer from uh, data cache misses. You know that, that's kind of not that surprising when you think about what what a hash join does. I mean, it, it's accessing memory in a pattern that the 
hardware prefetching systems can't predict. So therefore, it you know if it's unless the whole thing fits in in some level of the cache hierarchy, then you know you're going to have a load of misses. And so this is this paper investigates one way of dealing with that. There are designs that try to avoid um, cache misses by partitioning very carefully so that the hash table partitions fit into, um, say, L3 cache or maybe even L2. The problem with L3 cache is that it's shared by multiple cores. Um, the problem with L2 cache is that it's tiny. So, um, you know, this is quite a complicated thing. And, and the, the sort of survey papers that I read, um, you know, it didn't really, it sounded incredibly complicated and um, not that clear that it always wins. Uh, so that's not something that I tried to do for parallel hash join, but um, it stuck in my mind as an interesting problem. Um, and this alternative approach to the problem, I think is pretty interesting. So the idea is to use the prefetch instructions that you find in all modern um, architectures at just the right time to get um, things into your uh, caches before you need them. So it's pretty much the same thing as we were doing uh, a few slides back, with, w except that was disk and this is memory. <laughs> um, so there are some famous examples of people complaining loudly that this stuff never works. Um, in particular, if you try and if you try and prefetch just one pointer ahead in in a linked list or something like that, it just doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense. You, you're not. It's not really a pipeline at all. It's just not helping. And there was. A, famous case where the Linux kernel used to have a bunch of prefetch stuff sprinkled around in it and it all got ripped out because it was actually slower than uh, it was actually making it slower um, for one for one thing it was prefetching off the end of of chains and it wasn't prefetching the head node because it didn't know where, where that was it was prefetching the next one but the length was usually one so the next thing was usually null and then that was causing um, some type of stall itself so you know the there and there are other examples you could find on the internet of people saying, "Hey, don't use this; it never works." But if you can get far enough ahead, it clearly does, and it's pretty easy to measure that, that it's a useful technique. So I tried to do that with Postgres hash joins. So let's try and run a couple of queries to demonstrate these effects. So um, the first thing is on unpatched master. You can see that. When the query fits in, when the query gets divided into 256 batches, so that it, it the hash table fits into um, the L3 cache on this system, so it's 2.4 megabytes there. I think probably eight megabytes of L3 cache here. Um, it runs in 4.2 seconds, and it's generated six million LLC misses. Um, but when I tell it to, to use one gigabyte of of, of work mem, so that there's no batching required. Now it's generating 28 million LLC misses. So that's a pretty crazy number. And we see that it now takes 5.8 seconds. So adding more memory made this hash join slower. In the patched version, um, it goes from 4.2 down to 4 seconds when it is small enough for the L3 cache. Um, so that's an improvement already. Similar number of LLC misses. Which I think is a clue that the, these misses are coming from the partitioning phase. Um, and then when we go to the one gigabyte uh, version, it's now running in 2.7 seconds. Uh, it's loaded 482 megabytes of data into um, the hash table, uh, no no partitioning phase, and it's winning. And it's generated only, only, only I say only, 2.4 L, uh, million LLC misses. So this seems to be pretty successful. And although this is a pretty contrived query, um, you can see, you can measure speed ups in uh, TPCH queries and so on. I haven't done good enough testing to include any on, any on slides just yet, but um, yeah, that's something I'm, I'm looking into. So why does that work? Well, um, remember that um, hash joins have two phases. Well, 
three phases or two phases, depending on whether you partition first. And in the build phase, um, normally we spin through all the tuples on the inner side and we um, copy them into, into memory and insert them into the hash table. Um, so the change here is that instead of inserting them into the hash table, we, we just load them into a little buffer that uh, knows which bucket they need to go into. And it's got a size, uh, I think I was using 64 here. It doesn't doesn't seem to be too sensitive actually, uh, as long as it's more than a few. Um, and I, whenever that gets full, then I flush it. That's when I do all the um, insertions into the hash table. Now that on its own is responsible for a small amount of the, st of the speed up. Um, even without any prefetching. And then you can add the prefetching. Now that you've got a whole list of tuples that you know, you know you're going to insert, you've got the pointers, you know the buckets, you can prefetch the bucket headers, uh, and then in then you can insert them, and it goes faster. You um, And uh, so one of the reasons for the for going from 4.2 seconds to 4 seconds is that um, it's just that re rearrangement of the code because the um, CPU is now able to reorder some some stuff. It doesn't have dependencies on on uh, um, values that haven't been computed yet, and so on. So that's a it's kind of mechanical sympathy um, that's good to be aware of. And the other thing is that um, once you add the prefetches now, it um, it won't miss when it when it, when you actually do the insertion. That's relatively simple, and I did that bit first. Actually, I did that quite a long time ago, uh, more than a year ago, I think. And and it was, and I knew it was effective. But I sort of knew that the main part of this problem was really the probe side because the probe phase is typically bigger. We usually probe with the larger relation, and um, it was a whole lot less obvious how how to do it. Um, and what I've come up with so far is, in order to get my hands on tuples so that I can on the outer side so I can see far ahead, I actually create a little buffer of extra slots and then I copy tuples into those slots uh, and then the rest is sort of fairly obvious. Um, you do a sort of pipeline of computing hash values and prefetching, um, although in this case you can prefetch further ahead. When we're, when we're inserting we only need to prefetch the um, bucket um, itself because that's the only thing we're going to be touching, whereas uh, when you're going to be probing, there's actually a whole chain of things that you that you're going to finish up touching. There's the hash table bucket. There's the tuple that it points to, and then there's the tuple that that one points to. And figuring out how to get all of those things to uh, be prefetched in time is sort of the the name of the game. I think ideally there would be some much more efficient way to look further ahead at the tuples coming from the sub plan this concept of copying everything into extra slots. I know there's some other nodes that do that kind of thing, like, you know, during copying and so on, but, uh, sorry, doing sorting and so on. But, um, you know, it it feels like there should be an efficient way to, to move things around without having to materialize things all over the place. And um, I haven't got further than a basic copy-based system for now because I just wanted a proof of concept of the thing I was really trying to research, which is the you know, the, the, the hash join part of it. But I know that um, even with this um, apparently really stupid version of how you should buffer tuples, it does make, for example, the TPCH queries go faster, um, particularly with large memory size. So um, apparently, the you know, the overhead is worth it. Um, I mean, I think that's generally a theme with all of this kind of work. Um, anything involving, anything where you can avoid stalls, um, it can be worth doing quite a lot of extra work to avoid um, stalls. Well, that brings me to the end of my talk, and I hope you found some of this stuff interesting. Um, I've put a few pointers to uh, things that I mentioned along the way. And of course, pointers to patches. Well, thanks for listening.